Well, thanks for coming. My name is uh, Stefan Herhut, and uh, I'm a research scientist at Intel Labs in uh, sunny Santa Clara in California. So I can tell you outside it's raining. I had to step outside and actually enjoy the rain for a bit because I haven't seen it in months. So uh, uh, if you want some rain uh, after this talk, is your chance. Um, so at Intel Labs, I work on uh, River Trail, which is uh, our proposal to bring parallel computing to uh, JavaScript. And I've done that for uh, probably roughly the last three years. And I haven't done anything in JavaScript before. So that was uh, quite an interesting journey for me. Um, and whenever you want to design something new, uh, you have to learn what was there before or what the, uh, the other offerings are. So I had some time in these three years to actually look at JavaScript and understand a little bit what, what concurrency is in JavaScript, how that works, how all parallel computing works, and uh, what's happening in that space. So I'll use the next 35, 40 minutes um, to share some of these things I found uh, particularly interesting um, about concurrency and parallel computing. Um, this talk does not mean to be complete, so there's probably a lot more happening in that space. And I also try to be more practical than, than giving anything on, on theory. Having said that, um, one thing I want to put, put in front of you before I actually start is um, something about terminology. Because I, I see this a lot, and it's, it's relatively easy to confuse the two in, in everyday language, but there's a big difference between concurrency and parallel computing. And let's make that clear before uh, we kind of dive into these topics. So what is concurrency? And I've tried to, to come up with a definition. And um, this is what I, what I kind of distilled out of various online dictionaries. Essentially, concurrency is if you perform multiple tasks at the same time and do them pos possibly interleaved. But the important thing here is it's just one single entity performing these tasks. So in reality, there's not really multiple things happening at the same time. It's just one entity that has multiple things to do and just interleaves them, right? So here's an example for you. Um, this is a concurrent system. And I'm always very amazed when I see these one-man bands because I would totally fail at this. But what they do, essentially, you have one actor, which is the musician here, and he interleaves performing all these various tasks to create the music. So this is a concurrent system. So you can keep this picture in mind whenever I say concurrent. So what, on the other hand, is a parallel system then? Right. So parallel computing is if you have multiple entities working at the same time. And they may do the same thing. So they may share a task between them. Or they may actually doing multiple tasks. Right. The first thing is what we often refer to as something like, like data parallel operations, where you do the same thing with multiple entities at the same time on one piece of data. Or in task parallelism, you have more the case of actually having multiple entities doing different things, but still at the, at the same time. So of course, I had to also find a picture to get this across. So this is an example of a parallel system, right? You have multiple entities, the workers here, and they're all performing a task. They're building a car. The important thing is it's actually multiple things happening at the same time. So whenever I say parallel computing, this is the picture you come back to. OK. so. The agenda, what will I actually be talking about? So who of you is a web developer or does web development? No. That's the large majority. That's good. So if you are a web developer, you're actually an expert in writing concurrent systems, but you might not actually know it. Because if you write web applications, you do this event-driven asynchronous programming, which is writing concurrent programs. Right? You have all these events, and they are somewhat interleaved. Um, so you're performing multiple tasks, but you have one entity that does them, which is your browser. So we'll talk a bit about this event-driven programming and what, how, the, how the model works and what the pitfalls in these models are. Next, I will talk a bit about promises, because uh, I have the feeling that's something that's, that's you know, somewhat important to people currently. If I looked at Strange Loop, there's a lot of talking about async and all these things. So I thought I'd talk a bit about promises and why I think they are great. And lastly, if you talk about uh, concurrency on the web, uh, you have to mention web workers. There's no, no way around it. So I will talk a little bit about web workers, too. So that will be roughly the first half of this talk. The second half will be talking about parallel computing. And the reason why I think this is important is you're essentially surrounded by parallel hardware. Right? No matter what you look at, whether it's a mobile phone, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop, a server, anything really, 
you will have some parallel hardware in there. Uh, most, the, any processor today, uh, every processor today has some SIMD units inside. So they are just ubiquitous there everywhere. Um, you have multi-cores, right? Many mobile phones even have a multi-core system today. So you better make use of those multi-cores too. And lastly, programmable GPUs are really mainstream and they're becoming more and more mainstream across the range of devices. So you need to have some story of how you program these GPUs. So that will be the second half of my talk. Okay, so with that, um, let's get into it. Let's talk about concurrency. Uh, although the majority of people here are web developers, I thought I'd first talk a bit about how execution actually works in JavaScript on a, on a very, very high level. So you all know in JavaScript you have this single event queue. So essentially, everything that happens in your browser has to go through this event queue eventually. And what's very nice about this programming model from a conceptual perspective is that all events always run to completion before anything else is executed. Right? So if you have an event handler, you can really rely on the fact that your event handler will complete before the next event handler starts. And that's a very comfortable space to be in because you do not have to reason about what's happening to your global state because somebody else is mutating that. It's only you running and you're on your own. There are some exceptions to this, what the DOM can do and all these things, but essentially that's your programming model. Another thing you can do, which is very powerful, if you are inside of your event handler, you can actually create new events. You can set a timeout, you can just enqueue an event to start right away, sometime after your current event. So that's what enables you to decompose a bigger task into smaller tasks and create this impression of a, a very responsive system by interleaving all these small tasks. But of course, where there's sun there's also shadow. Uh, one big drawback of this model, I think, is it's uh, non-deterministic. So you never know when what event will run. And to some part, that's just because it's the web browser and a lot of the events depend on the outer world, uh, like a user clicking or some response from the network. So that non-determinism, you just cannot change. But also some events are just underspecified, so you don't know in what order they do happen. So you have to live with this uncertainty never to know what event handler will run next. Uh, I will lose a little, use a little graphic representation during my talk, so I wanted to introduce it here quickly. Um, I think it's relatively self-explanatory. So this big box is your, is your event queue, and these small boxes are events. I use random colors because it looks good, but they typically don't mean anything. Um, you have, this is just some JavaScript code. You have a mouse event, onload event, a timer event, and this little arrow down here, that tells you uh, where execution currently is at. Right? So that's, that's my graphical representation. So what example do you do if you talk to people about event-based programming? Um, what I did, I just uh, went to Stack Overflow and asked it, you know, what examples do you have? So I hope you can read this, even in the back. So there's an example from uh, Stack Overflow on asynchronous image loading. So how does that work? Um, essentially, what this code does, you create this image object, and then you have a URL where you want to load from, and the container where you want to put that image into once you're done loading. Right? It's a standard idea of uh, loading something after the web page has already rendered. Down here is the actual interesting code. So you assign to the source attribute of your image the URL you want to load. And that actually tells the browser, hey, go fetch that image. What you also do is you assign this function here to this onload attribute, which tells the JavaScript runtime, once this image has loaded and the onload event is fired, please call this callback. Right? So how this then runs at runtime, so your buff code is running, and eventually it comes to the point where you assign this URL. That will kick off your browser, it will fetch the image. Um, eventually this onload event will appear because the image has been loaded, and once your execution reads that onload event, that callback is called, and you actually insert the image into your website. Does anyone see any problem with that? So? Yeah. So, you know, seasoned web developer knows the problem. So here you assign the URL first, and then you assign the onload event. So I said, you know, events always run to completion. So what's wrong with that? Where's the problem? The problem is this will instantly fire off the loading of the image. And if it's in the cache, it might instantly create this onload event. 
but you have not actually registered your callback here. So that event will just turn into thin air. So although this, that's the point, although it looks really, really simple, um, you have to be aware of what event semantics really are. So it's not as simple as you always run to completion. It's still a concurrent system. You still have some interleavings of other things in your system happening, and you have to be very, very aware of event semantics. And um, just to put that right, so on Stack Overflow, the example actually was correct. So I photoshopped it. Um, um, you are still allowed to trust uh, Stack Overflow. So be, be careful with this. This is another way of looking at the same problem. And here, it's, it's, it's abstracting a little away from the code and more looking at the flow of your asynchronous operation. So what's happening here? Um, the idea is you render first your generic website. That's, that's at the top. And once that has completed, that's this little arrow here, you want to run your load image code. So that's the code I showed before. In here, you have this, this callback that calls this render image, which is your uh, actually inserting the image into your, into your website. So what you've done here, you have encoded this dependency in time between the loading of the image and the rendering of the image as um, an onload callback. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's something you know, people have been doing all the time. But let's look at something that's a little bit more complex than just using uh, loading a single image. So this is an arbitrary example I just cooked up because it kind of puts the point across. So what about you want to do a personalized website, but you don't want to render the website personalized right away. You want to render a standard website and then do some asynchronous magic in the background and eventually personalize that website for the person that's viewing it. So how would such a flow look like? So you start with your rendering of the generic website. And then once that's done, um, you do a lookup operation. Yeah, you can think of this like uh, talking back to your home server uh, to look up in the database uh, what the user actually is, something like that. Once you figure out who that user is, you ask some other services what they know about this user, right? So you could load an avatar image, you could look at social status, you know, what's the guy doing on Twitter and Facebook and all those. Um, or you could look up what's, what has happened on, on my website recently, right? But again, these could be all asynchronous operations you start. Once you, all of them are finished and you actually have the data you wanted, um, you can now create your personal view. Right. So this is just an example of a more complicated asynchronous decomposition of a problem. If you do this in the same callback style that we've seen before, um, you end up in something that's uh, uh, often called the callback nesting hell. So you end up in these deeply nested uh, function definitions. Or you have this inversion by defining all your callbacks first and then actually putting them into place later. So essentially, you destroy the linearity of your code. So both of that is, is ugly, but you know, as a web developer, you kind of came to, to know how that works. You know how to write code that way, and you know how to read code that way. That's OK. But there's a more fundamental problem with that, I believe. And that is if you look at errors. So any of these operations can fail at any time. right? So the lookup could fail because your web server is gone. Um, some of the social networks decided not to like you today, not to give you any data. Maybe even the rendering of your personal view fails because you can't make any sense of that data. Right? Any of these operations can fail during uh, uh, the execution of your website. So that's something you have to cater for. And that means you have to have some error handler. And typically, you want to handle the error down here. Right? You don't care if it fails anywhere in this pipeline because there's nothing you can do. Yes, maybe you can retry, but what's the point? Just more latency. So what you really want to do is if anything fails here, you just want to tell the user, hey, look, it didn't work. So you want to have an error handler down here. So how do you encode that in your asynchronous flow? Well, you have to add all these edges and all these callbacks for all these operations to that handler. And that's the point when it really, really gets messy. Right? So you don't want to be in this situation. And that's where I believe promises really, really help. So what's a promise? So the essential idea in promises is you take this asynchronous flow and you model it in data. You create objects for every operation in there, and then you model the dependencies between these objects. So promise objects encodes where an asynchronous operation is. And it has a couple of methods that allow you to encode different patterns of dependency. 
right? You can have a sequence, something happens after the other, uh, some two things can happen at the same time, or you can wait for multiple things to have happened, right? That's some patterns you have. But what's really, really great about this, errors propagate along the flow. And you can think of this like exceptions. So in, in, in normal programming, if you throw an exception, it just propagates until somewhere there's a, there's a catch. And you want to have the same in asynchronous programming. You want to throw an error, and then it propagates along your flow until there's somebody who cares. And that's what promises give you. So let's look at how you write this in, in a promise style. So the first thing you do, um, you create um, your, your, your render, which is this operation. And it doesn't return your result. It returns your render promise. So as I said, this promise essentially encodes the state of that operation. And there's three valid states. It can be pending, which means it's still doing, it hasn't completed yet, or it's still waiting for something. It can be fulfilled, which means it has done what it was supposed to do, and it produced a valid value. Or it can be rejected, which means either it failed or one of its dependencies failed. So at any time, a promise can be in one of these states. And depending on what state it is, it will do different things. So let's continue with our example here. Um, the next, we want to do the lookup. And what we say is, um, our lookup promise is, once you've rendered, then do the lookup. And this then here encodes that edge in our asynchronous flow. Similarly, um, we do the three interactions down here. So once the lookup has finished, then do the load, or, and then do the social, and then do the recent. So you can have multiple edges that go out. And lastly, we have this pattern down here. Once all of them has finished, then you want to create your personal view. And here I use WinJS, so you can say, when all of these are done, then do the create. Right? It's a very straightforward way to implement this asynchronous flow and to actually can look at it and understand what it does. Compare this to callback nesting hell, and I think you see the, the immediate advantage. But compare this to how you do error handling here. So here are your errors. How do I do the error handling? Here's my handler. Well, in case you haven't seen the difference, let's highlight it for you. You add this handler down here. And that says, when anything fails somewhere, uh, it goes all the way to the first handler it encounters. And that will just do the magic and do whatever it needs to do. So this is like exceptions. You just say where you want to catch it, and there you then catch it. OK, so this was very short, just an idea about promises. There's way more to say about promises. There's a lot of discussion on promises. Um, I want to point you particularly to Promises A+, which is uh, the ongoing uh, try to develop a standard for what a promise should do. Uh, many, many libraries implement promises in, in different ways and different flavors. Um, jQuery has something that's somewhat similar to a promise, but not really. So there's a lot of, of things out there you can look at but I think they will become ubiquitous uh, in, in web development rather soon. OK, let's switch to another topic. That was promises. Um, who has seen this window before? Yeah, that's, that's quite a few. So I've put a black box over the URL because I didn't want to embarrass a particular developer here. But um, this is when your web application goes wrong, right? So this is the, your web browser is telling you, hey, this script is running too long. I can't do anything else. Um, it's actually not me, the web browser, who's frozen. It's that website's fault, right? This is just about blame. It's just the browser vendor saying, hey, it's not our browser. Um, so how does this happen? Well, typically, the reason is you have a very long running event. And as I said before, you have this event-based model, and it enables concurrency, but only one event executes at a time. And that also means that no event is ever interrupted. That's the JavaScript's concurrency model. So if you look at an example down here, if you really have one of these big, fat events sitting in here that has a long, long running time, all the other events are queuing up. And the underlying problem here is it's about scheduling granularity. So if you interleave operations in your queue, you never interrupt any of the events. And that means if you have a long event, um, your, your, uh, your browser seems to stall. So what do you do about this? How do you fix this? And that's where I think wet workers really fit in nicely. That's where you want to have a wet worker. So what is a wet worker? Um, essentially, 
a web worker allow you to spawn off a new instance of the JavaScript engine. So you get a completely separate JavaScript engine conceptually that can run your code. They have no shared state. So one engine can't see what the other does, which is really nice because it keeps this, my event is running on its own kind of property of, of the concurrency model. Uh, but it also means you have to send messages across if you want to communicate data. And that's what's called the actor model. And it also has its own event queue, its own message queue. And that's what really helps if you want to have concurrency with long running tasks. Why does it help? So if you look at the situation, if you have a web worker, what you get, you get another worker uh, with a, another message queue. And now you can put the long running event onto that message queue. And in your main queue, all you do is you send the message and then you can keep going with your other events until eventually this long event has run, sends back a message that is completed, and then you can continue react to what it's done. As I said before, this is concurrent programming, right? So you're the one-man band. So it doesn't mean that these things run at the same time. All this really changed is it gives you a different granularity of scheduling. So these two things may now be interleaved, uh, more fine granular. So your, your operating might decide to do a little bit of this, then a little bit of that, then again a bit of this, a bit of that, right? You just get better granularity. So web workers make a lot of sense even if you're not on a parallel system. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about concurrent program, yeah? Uh, what about job time emulation as a web worker? Uh, uh, no, so the, the, the main JavaScript thread, that's where the DOM lives. And as you create a new instance, that instance doesn't have a copy of the DOM because you, you, know, you couldn't copy it. There's just one, one browser window. So that sits with, uh, stays with the browser engine. Right? But uh, typically, if you think about it, the interactions with the DOM are relatively short. Right? You update something in the DOM. That's not a long running operation. It's more like if you have to compute something complicated or, or something like that, or you have something uh, other complex running on, that's when a web worker makes sense. Right. You want to sort some data, or you have a big hash table you do something in, or these kind of things. Okay. So parallel computing. Um, just to remind you again, uh, why is this important? Um, I said it's everywhere. And I think so far in JavaScript, parallel computing is a little bit underrepresented. So there's not much happening there. Uh, that might be a historic thing. So concurrent programming has been there way, way earlier than parallel programming. Right? Concurrency goes back, you know, all, all the time, I think even the Amiga OS had concurrency built in, although there was no parallel hardware at that time. So concurrency is a, is a very old uh, concept maybe, but I think it's time for the web to, to really catch up here. So there's three things that's, that's important to look at. You have multi-core CPUs, so you need a story on how to do something with them. Um, you have SIMD extensions, so you need a story of you know, doing something with those. And lastly, there's these programmable GPUs. So how do you do something with them? And I believe, really, if you want to get the best experience on a modern device, you have to work with all three of these. So eventually, you will have to write code that uses all three of these. Before coming to something new, of course, web workers also are a tool in parallel programming, right? Because they allow you to do task parallelism. If you run on an actual multi-core system, uh, nobody stops your operating system from actually scheduling these two queues on different cores. And at that point, you actually have a parallel system and have some parallel computation going on. So this is a great example where concurrency actually enables parallel computing. And so what you get here is you essentially get another execution unit and both of them now really execute at the same time. Right? So if you are on a multi-core, uh, web workers make, make sense uh, even more. So let's talk about uh, another topic. Let's talk about SIMD programming. So who knows what SIMD programming is and how it works? Okay, not everyone. So let me give you an idea. So at SIMD, the idea is uh, you typically compute on small vectors, like you have a vector of four or eight elements, and you perform the same operation on each element. And that's what SIMD stands for. It's single instruction, multiple data, doing the same thing for multiple values. Um, it's a very restricted programming model, so you're only allowed to do the same operation for every data, so you cannot have complex control flow, so you cannot have a conditional within uh, a vector computation. Um, 
But it's very, very fast and very powerful because CPUs have this built in directly. So if you compute on a four element vector, you can do four additions, say, for instance, at the same time. Okay, let's play with this a little bit to get, to get a feeling. So who can envision uh, what that, this operation will do? Basic math skills, anyone? Yeah? Yeah. So you get uh, three, five, seven, nine, right? So you just add element by element. So this, this was an easy one. Uh, how about and? Who can do an and on those numbers? Well, I'm just kidding. Um, so and is, is the same thing you do it uh, element wise. What's interesting here is you can also do something like uh, less than. So what does less than do? This actually computes a predicate. Um, so it compares each element in this vector with each element in that vector and returns a truth value. So you get a vector of truths, right? So one is smaller than four, two is smaller than three, but three is not smaller than two and four is not smaller than one. So this gives you a vector of, uh, of Boolean values. Uh, with those, you can do interesting things. You have the select operation. So it essentially uh, gets a vector of these truth values. It gets a vector of values and another vector of values. And for every element where this is true, it will pick the element here. And for where this is false, it will pick the element there. So the result here should not be too hard to guess. Uh, you pick the first from here, so you get a one. The second comes from here, you get a three. The third comes from here, you get a three again. And the last comes from here. Uh, so you should get, uh, from there, you should get a five. That's another interesting operation. Um, another one that's quite commonly used is shuffle. So shuffle gives you permutations. It's another thing you can do on these little vectors. So um, this is your shuffle vector and essentially says, on this position of the result, I want to have that element of the input. Okay, so in our result, we get the third element first, then the second element, the first element, uh, the, and the zeroth element, so it's counting from zero. Um, so this essentially is a reverse. That's just to give you an idea of you know, how SIMD programming works. That's, that's the tools you have. So how do you add SIMD to JavaScript? And uh, there's a proposal by John uh, McCutcheon, I hope I pronounced his name right. Um, and essentially what you need to do if you want to do SIMD computing, first you need vectors, right? So what you do, you add these small vectors to JavaScript. So you get a float 32 x4, that's four floats. And you get an int 32 x4, that's four ints. Another thing you want, you need something to store them in. So that's what you get here with this float32x4 array. You can think of this like a typed array, but the only difference is it doesn't contain single numbers. It contains four tuple vectors of those numbers. And lastly, now you have these things, you have to compute on them. So that's where your, um, this special SIMD object comes in, and that's very similar to the math object you already have in JavaScript. So math defines things like square root, and SIMD def similarly defines operations on SIMD vectors. So you get your standard things, you get uh, arithmetics, uh, some binary operations, um, some comparison operations, uh, the select and shuffle I showed before, and there's some plenty more uh, where you can do uh, more, more bit stuff. Um, so really everything that, that a modern CPU architecture has can be reflected in these intrinsics into JavaScript. What's important to note here though, and that's, that's different to, to the math object, um, typically in JavaScript, if you store something like a float 32 x, float in a float32 typed array and you read that value back, it's converted to a double because everything in JavaScript is a double. That's different here for SIMD. So if you read this float32 vector, it stays as a float32. Okay, here's a SIMD example. Um, it's a very simple one. We start, uh, let's assume we have A and B, which are float32 x4, uh, float32 arrays. Uh, we create a new float32 array, and then we want to add them. And we do that in this loop, and you add them one element by one element. That's standard JavaScript. So how do we do this in SIMD? The code actually is quite similar. Um, you now have a float32 x4 array as your input, and you create a new float32 x4 array uh, for your output, and then you iterate over the entire length, and all you change, you call the SIMD add. So this loop will now add four elements at a time. 
and everything works out fine and everything's great, uh, this will speed up greatly. Yeah? That will convert to doubles. So the result is different. Yes, that's the that's the you know, the, the, the slightly similar uh, semantic difference you have here. This will compute on doubles. This will compute on floats. So you have to be aware of that. Okay, this is very simple. Uh, let's look at something that's slightly more complex. Um, I've put in a conditional here, just uh, to make this more interesting. As I said before, uh, you cannot do conditionals directly if you program SIMD style. You have to do them in data. So how do you transform this? What this does here, if AI is greater than 10, you just sum up the Bs, otherwise you sum up A and B. A straightforward way to do this in SIMD is you just compute both of the branches. Right? So I compute um, an XT here, which is adding B and B, that's my then branch. I compute an XE, which is adding A and B, that's my else branch. And then I compute a predicate which decides for every element whether a i is greater than 10. I've simplified a bit here because you would need a vector of 10s, but that wouldn't fit on the slides. So once I have this predicate, I can then use my select operation, that should be a p, and select the elements from xt or xe, and I will end up with the same result. An issue here, of course, is you have replicated computation. So you're actually computing more but as you're computing four things at a time, you might still be faster. So SIMD programming isn't easy. You know, there's a little bit of wizardry in there to actually figure out whether it's faster or not. But um, if you know uh, how it works, and if you know how the performance model works, this can give you great speed ups. So if you want to know more about SIMD, um, there's the proposal I was talking about. Uh, that's, that's at ACMA, so you can give your comments. It also has a polyfold implementation, which allows you to actually uh, run this code and see how it behaves. And uh, there's also some effort from Intel and Mozilla, <coughs> excuse me, from Intel and Mozilla to actually implement this in Firefox. So if you look at this bug number here, uh, you can follow the progress there. So this is programming on small SIMD vectors. The last thing I want to talk about today is if you program on a little bit bigger data than a four element vector. And that's where Rivertrail comes in. That's what I'm working on. And that kind of closes this, this relatively long story this, this morning. So how do you program if you have more than four elements, if you actually have an array? And the ideas are very similar to SIMD programming. So the difference is we now operate on n-dimensional arrays. Right? Instead of a four-element vector, we have arrays that might contain further arrays. And we still perform the same operation on every element of, of these arrays, mostly, right? We also do reductions and things like that, but mostly it's the same kind of idea. And this is designed not for SIMD units, although it might auto-vectorize and actually run on your SIMD unit, but this is with multi-core CPUs and GPUs in mind. So what does it look like? Um, this has gone through a lot of iterations, and we got a lot of great feedback, but it's still open for feedback, so if you have some, please talk to me. Um, but right now, it's an extension of JavaScript array objects and the upcoming typed objects, uh, which were formerly known as binary data. And essentially, what we've done is we've added six new methods, um, which all end in this nice word par, which uh, tries to hint you that this is a parallel uh, primitive. So we have build par, which allows you to construct an array in parallel. We have map par, which is like the JavaScript map, but it runs in parallel. Similarly, we have reduce par. Um, then we also have scan, uh, which is, an, is a nice primitive if you want to do things like uh, prefix sums, uh, similar operations. Uh, we have scatter, which is for uh, permutations. So if you have an array and you want to move elements around, then scatter is your friend. And finally, we have filter, which allows you to drop elements from an array. So these are the, essentially the six new primitives we give you. So let's look at a very simple example. Increment. Right? So we start out with this array up here. And then we call this map par function, which uh, gets a function, which we call the elemental function as its argument, which, given an element, computes the new element. Right? And everybody of you who has done JavaScript programming before and has used map will say right away, this looks like map. So this is the standard JavaScript map. And yes, they look very similar except for these three letters, but there is a big semantic difference. This one here the JavaScript standard one runs left to right, whereas this one here on top runs in any order and potentially in parallel. 
So how do we make this happen? There's one big property we need to allow for parallel execution. And that's really the big new concept that parallel JavaScript or Revit Trail introduces. And that's temporal immutability. So the idea here is that while your elemental function, your parallel code is running, it is not allowed to mutate the global heap. So the global heap becomes temporally immutable. You're not allowed to change it. So let me show you an example for this. Here it is, my increment again. So this is a very contrived way to write increment in JavaScript, but it's actually legal. So what does this do? Uh, again, you do a map and you apply this function and it now gets the value and the index and you do a plus plus on AI, which is a side effect here to this global A, and return the value. So what this does, it returns an array that has every value incremented, but as a nice side effect, also increments every value in the original array. This is valid JavaScript code. I'm not saying you should write it, but it's valid JavaScript code. It's not valid for parallel execution, though, because this is mutating the global state. So this elemental function here is not temporally immutable. So this will not run in parallel, it will be uh, rejected by your browser. OK, let's look at another example, sum. So this is sum. For sum, we use uh, reduce. Uh, again, you get a function with two and you get two elements, a and b, and you return the sum of the two. So what this does, this computes the sum of all elements of the input array. Again, this looks very similar to the JavaScript reduce, but there's a fundamental difference. In the JavaScript reduce, if you look at the specification, it says the first argument is the previous value, and the second argument is the current value. You even get an index where you're currently at. In parallel execution, we don't have any of these concepts. Because other than the sequential case, which does a reduce left to right, we may reduce this in any order. So we cannot tell you which one is the previous, which one is the current. It might even be that some of these values are nowhere to be found inside of the array because there are some arbitrary intermediate sums. Another uh, important thing is this function has to be associative and commutative to allow for arbitrary reorderings. So if you want to make sure that you always get the same result when running in parallel, you have to make sure that property is fulfilled. So lastly, let me give you a slightly more complex example that makes use of typed objects. So who has seen typed objects binary data before? Ah, it's getting fewer and fewer. So, uh, let me give you an example. So what the goal in typed objects is, you can think of it a bit like uh, typed arrays and steroids. So the idea is you take typed arrays and you extend them to be uh, nested arrays and you extend them to also have C-like structures and then essentially you add typed objects. So what we do here, we declare two types. So pixel is an array type of U and 8. So you can think of this as a four element typed array. And image is an array type of array type of pixel. So this is a two dimensional array that has four element arrays inside. So this is how you would represent an RGB alpha image uh, typically on the web, right? This is what's in Canvas. So let's assume we have this kind of image and uh, we just get it using this get image function here. So how do we compute something like grayscale on this in parallel? And grayscale is a pixel to pixel operation, right? You take a pixel, you compute the grayscale value and that gives you your new pixel. So this is how you write it. Uh, you take the image, you do a parallel map, and you get this new thing here, which is this number two, that's the depth. So you have to tell map how deep you want to iterate. If you have a nested array, you could iterate over the rows, that's the depth of one, but if you want to see every pixel, you want to iterate over the two outermost dimensions, and that's a depth of two. So this will go over all pixels, and then for every pixel call this function, and this function just computes the luminance out of the R, G, and B values, and returns a new pixel, uh, which has the luminance, and we just pass through the alpha channel. So this is how you do grayscale. And we played a lot with this kind of operation. So we implemented uh, game physics, we did some computer vision algorithms, we did 3D animations, and you can get really, really decent speed ups. Um, we have a prototype that's available on GitHub, so if you want to play uh, with that, it has slightly different uh, API, but it gives you an idea of how it would perform on a GPU too. So if you want to have more, um, uh, Mozilla is actually implementing this uh, in a joint project with us in Nightly. So if you download Nightly, you can start playing at least with the array part of the API. And there's also the ECMA proposal out. So we've written a proposal to put this into JavaScript and it's, it's very open for comments. Um, also, you can look at the typed objects proposal. Um, that's for the next version of, uh, of ECMAScript. Uh, 
uh, which we build on. So that's, that's a building block. And that concludes my talk. So I hope I, I've shown you that concurrency is just a given on web development. So it's everywhere. Um, you have to be aware of event semantics. Uh, promises, I think, are a great way to encode errors and do error handling. And uh, web workers, um, think about web workers for long running tasks. Also, parallel computing, it's becoming more and more important. So you should uh, start looking into it. Um, web workers for task parallelism right now. Uh, SIMD is coming, so if you have small computations on vectors, take a look at SIMD. And uh, lastly, parallel JavaScript, um, if you have some larger scale operations uh, on array. So with that, uh, thank you. I think I'm out of time, but uh, you can catch me afterwards for questions.